She oh. drove away, and I'm waving. I'm waving at her from the dealership parking lot. And then I turned, and this voice hit me. What would you just do? Mm. What would you just do? Yeah. So you can't compromise who you are for the money. Well. Welcome to the Big Fish Cares Podcast. And here's your host, Benny Fisher. We're in the Big Fish Care studio here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I got a really good guest for you today. My friend, John Glanaman, who's the managing director of the Dale Carnegie, Western PA, Central PA, and Northeast Ohio. It's kind of cool because, you know, Northeast Ohio is my roots. I'm here in Western PA. I love sales. I love Dale Carnegie. You see the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Been a big influence on my life, you know, as my journey in car sales, mortgages, cell phones, you know, entrepreneurship running a business. Uh, But we're not going to talk about business today. We're not even going to talk about sales. I know some of you guys might want to listen to it, but we're going to talk to John. Who is John Glanneman? Where did you get started? Where? Tell us about the origins. The origins. So I uh, grew up in 84. I still live in 84. And we're the only people in the world who have a town that's a number. And everywhere I travel, people are just intrigued by that. You mean your town is a number? Yeah, my Well, they've heard of 84 Lumber because Joe Hardy made it famous, so that helps. They don't put it together, though. I have to make that connection. The first thing I say is, have you heard of 84 Lumber? Oh, well, of course I've heard of 84 Lumber. Well, 84 Lumber got its name from 84 PA. So that's a a cool story. Uh, Grew up in, back then, we didn't have so many housing plans. It was still rural. It was farm country. A lot of dairy farms, Pennsylvania Dutch dairy farms, and our road was gravel. <laughs> gravel. I almost, Ben, I almost shed a tear a couple years ago when the frackers paved our road. Oh, boy. I'm like, man, it's time to move further out. Yeah, because all you guys in 84 PA, man, you guys all struck gold. I mean, like all the people that own lots true. of land, man, like, you know, they got paid, right? Back like, over statement. the last 10, 15 years, man, like... That is like the oil capital of like southwestern Pennsylvania, I feel like. So Washington County is ground zero for fracking, for the Marcellus Shale Formation. And so those who played their cards wisely made out very well and are still to this day making out very well. It's that recurring revenue stream. Like It is recurring revenue. That's exactly right. <laughs> it's like All money just owners. floats in the air, like gushes out of the, out of the floor, right? Yeah, we just sit back and collect checks. Yeah, well, that's 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 a whole other podcast. We can that is, that. that's next week. But what was it like growing up there? Like, what did your parents do for a living? So my uh, my dad was an engineer with a, with a utility, and my mom was, for the most part, a homemaker, stay-at-home okay. mom. But she had some part-time jobs. She was a seamstress for a while, her and a neighbor friend. She worked at a flower shop for a number of years. She worked at the Hallmark shop So some for classic years. stuff that some like moms from back in that dad type yep. days. When did you grow up? Wait, what decade was that? Would that be the 70s? It was the 70s. 70s, yeah, okay. I, I'm, an, I'm an Xer. An Xer. I'm a Gen X. Yeah, I can't keep sure. up with all that. What am I? I was born in 81. Am I like You're a, a millennial. A millennial. No, You're I don't like to be. I, what's the one before that? Xers. Xers, see, yeah. yeah. See, I'd like to, I'd rather be an Xer. I think I am an Xer. You could at be. Heart. At the, a tweener. Could, I'm a tweener. I'm a tweener. I think that's what makes me so unique <laughs> and special is I get to be both. <laughs> you are 100% not a Zer. <laughs> yeah, no. Nah. You're you're barely a millennial. How about that? Yeah. In well, fact, we'll I can, adopt you. Because I can communicate. Right. And it's through some of the teachings of our buddy, Dale Carnegie, that I was able to learn some of these techniques. We'll get into that towards the end of the show. But so what was it like growing up with, you know, pretty successful dad? You know what I mean? Like, you know, smart guy, right? College educated, right? Like that's very rare from back in the day. Now everybody goes to college. Everybody's got a degree. Right. But back then that was pretty special. I mean, it was, it was. So he had, uh, he had two degrees. He had his engineering degree and then he had a master's in civil engineering which helped propel him to uh, division engineer and then division manager. So he, he did very, very well for himself and was, uh, he was a role model. Here's how you be successful in life. Here's how you push your kids. You provide for your kids, but you don't do for your kids. Mm. And so, um, I did not have a rough childhood, Ben. Uh, we never wanted for anything. Uh, we were not, uh, the upper crust, if you will, definitely right. middle class. But um, my mother cooked every single night. 
We had a home cooked meal every same night. time. Like was it like same structured? Time. Dude, you were at the table at five, or you needed to have a reason why. Was, so dad was home from work by five. Yeah. Yes, and like and it was like everybody like did you have to do homework right after school? Or did you go play after school and then do homework later after dinner? What was the, what was it like at the Glanaman house? So we we came home and we would play. We okay, would play. and then eat dinner, and, and then we would eat dinner, and, and then, then it was homework time okay. or. And unless there were sports thrown in, if you played a sport, if you did an, if you did an after school activity, then there was no play time. You'd come home by then. It's it's dinner time. So I rode the country bus. We had an activity bus in the high country school. bus. Like, was, is that different than the the city the bus? City bus. Is there a city bus? There like, what city? city? Like, okay, so I went to I know where eighty four is. I went to Ringgold. I went yeah. to Ringgold. We were uh, we were on the very edge of the school district. And so Ringgold, the activities bus, there were two of them. There was a city bus and there was a country bus. The city bus would hit Monongahill and Donora as okay. if those were cities, Yeah, right? Donora, where Ken Griffey Jr. is from, Stan Musial. Stan Musial, Stan Joe Demand. Montana was Monongahela, yep. right? So, like, that Park was, Avenue. like, yeah. So you were out in the country, right? And I, I'm, I'm describing this for the viewers because a lot of my listeners all over the country, they have no idea. But when I say Monongahela, they're going to pronounce it Monongahela, da, da, da. Just know Joe, Mo- just know Mo- jo- Joe Montana country, Ken Griffey Sr. country country yep. stan musual like legendary for sports but john's family was out in the boonies we were in the boonies out, that's right. out in the country we were in the country yeah it was almost like a different planet so that's the country it bus. was it was a different world it so was did you get made fun of at school no no we, right. didn't get, we didn't get made fun was of it like, was we there were like the, segregation we were the, between the country boys and oh, the yeah. city boys there, there were so okay. the, the country the country bus there was uh probably about a dozen of us or so and then Monongahale and Denor was where most of the student population came. How, sort of how old are you right now? I'm 55. So you're younger than Joe Montana because Joe Montana's got to be in his 60s now, right? Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's probably six or seven years on me. Yeah. And if, not a li- if not a little more. Ken Griffey Sr., you probably remember when he was around because Ken Griffey Jr. has probably got to be a little bit younger than you, I bet. Not, uh, bit. Bert, yeah. not much. Not much. Not much. Because he was born supposedly on his baseball card. He said he was born into an RPA, but I know his dad was playing for the Reds. And then I'm shortly after that, I'm sure Ken Griffey, like they probably left Denora and like didn't really call it home anymore and probably made Cincinnati home. But like I digress because I'm a sports kid from back in, the, back in the day. So anyway, so growing up, very, you know, structured, uh, very, you know, very like um, TV like, right? Like, you know, like leave it to Beaver kind of. Like, leave Harris. it to Beaver. Right. We weren't perfect, man. Did you, all right. Yeah. So tell me when you say not perfect, give me some stories of like. A little bit of adversity that you might have encountered as a young Glanaman. So um, we we uh, like all families, not not being perfect. We had some arguments, some cabbages thrown, some uh, some things tossed over the hillside, plowing gardens, those normal kind of normal kind of things. Uh, but we were, geez, I mean, we didn't have. Like violent adversity. Yeah. We didn't have drug and alcohol adversity. Right. Mental illness adversity. We didn't have any. We didn't have any of that. It was it was more um, you know, are you ever gonna finish your homework? That kind of adversity. Yeah, yeah, because they wanted you to be somebody. Like they wanted you to be they just wanted to make sure that you, you know, ended up like at least like them. Uh, if you know, if hopefully, if hopefully a little bit better, right? Uh, but you were telling me a little story before the show started about how um, you, when you were a kid, I think you said you were like maybe 12, 10 or 12 years old. Um, you got hit and run, right? Tell us, tell us, yeah. tell me that story. Cause that was good. Yeah. Uh, no, that wasn't, that, well, it wasn't good, wasn't but good. it's an interesting story. It, it is. So living out in the country, we would ride our bikes everywhere. And I only had a few close friends because we were, you know, spread, we were spread out. So I was at a birthday party one afternoon. I had rode my bike and I left the birthday party and I'm coming down a hill heading towards home. And I have no memory after that as to what exactly transpired. And uh, I woke up, I was in the car with my, with my mom, holding my brains in, telling my dad he's dying, drive faster. And then over the course of some hospital whatnot and some, a whole lot of bandaging and recovering and facial trauma, they, they determined that the only way that I could have had that amount of trauma. Was it? It was a car. A car hit me. Um, but they didn't have the forensics, you know, that they do now. Yeah. They would be scanning and and looking for molecules of stuff to try. There was there was really none of that. And so we have no idea. We have no idea who it who it was. Wow. And so that was um, 
how long were you out for? Like, how long was like the hospital stay? Like trying to recover from that part. Do you, do you remember that? Like, I was in and out of consciousness for a while. Um, I know, I know, it put me down for the whole summer. Oh, so it was like during summer. So you didn't. Summer, you, I lost you, the so summer. you didn't even get to miss school from it. Like it was like. No, no, my friends. Know, I, it I, just I, ruined the summer for you. Coming back, it did. It, it did. <laughs> You know, we had a we had an above ground swimming pool. Everybody's swimming. I'm just like, oh, my head's all bandaged up. Uh, my friend's birthday was in June, and so that's why I remember how it ruined the summer. But I went back to school. I didn't have any type of permanent follow up surgeries or any of that. I had a head injury. Um, I had to kind of clip the jaw back together, and it, it totally screwed up my. my what teeth. when you, if you can remember back, like you know, I know you probably had all these dreams, aspirations. You know, what kids do right. Hey, I want to be an astronaut. I don't know. What did you want to be at that time? Like when you grew up, do you remember? I, I do. I wanted to be a soldier. A soldier. Yeah. Why did you want to be a soldier? I just felt kind of. Uh, pulled to that was that after page. vietnam like like were you watching the vietnam stuff was that i was too young too young yeah i was too young so what, was, it, was, was it like TV. yeah and tv probably only had three channels right like so and you know tv was like this big yeah and so it was black really, and so white really watch it so why, so why, why who dreams of like did, they t did your dad tell you stories in school did you mm -hmm. hear stories like so how did you it was uh it was kind of uh like John Wayne-ish, if you will. Like Cowboy Meets Cowboy American Flag. Yes. Like, all right. It was... It was uh, Did you watch movies? Was there a movie that inspired I you? Had a, uh, I had a G.I. Joe. Okay. So I had to... Uh, he had a Jeep. It was about this big. And my G.I. Joe doll was about this tall. And I pushed that thing. We had like four acres or so. I pushed that thing around the yard for weeks. That's good old American marketing for you at its finest because I think G.I. Joe was part of the big picture of how to promote us young American kids that want to be a soldier. A soldier. And it, it worked. worked. <laughs> it was spot on, man. The marketers pegged me and, and they had me. Well, I mean, when you look back at the history of marketing and the way that, you know, only a few people understood marketing back in the old days, right? Mm -hmm. The early 1900s, right? And you see some of these like little touches and tones, you know, now you see marketing everywhere. And like, it's almost like, you know, there's so much bad marketing, but back then it was really just good marketing. And the GI Joe is a great story of like how they were able to use an action figure, a toy, if you will, to promote some type of inner, like better cultural value, right? To where it can inspire you to actually take action. Uh, so that's interesting. So like after the rehab, or I mean, probably didn't even have like a real rehab like no, you there do was today. No, there, true, yeah, there was like, no rehab. Yeah, it was it's just... like, hey, we're not driving all the way to Pittsburgh to like, you know, put you through like <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it is, you know, just yep, brush it right. off, right? Now, was there any type of setback, any type of school, like learning disability, nothing from it? Like you just recovered well? Truly, there was no lasting. That's impressive, man. There was no lasting damage or. Now, there's there's things that I have dealt with up until my adult age with uh, some facial trauma, but I don't think of that a lot. I don't think of that event hardly ever. Like physically, or yeah. like um, like 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 cosmetically, or like like jaw things, like. So because you it, look normal to me, I mean, uh, as well. I mean, it's normal. It's the beard normal hides, as, you know oh, Okay, I mean? all right, yeah. So. Um, you can't really see it anymore, but I used to have a really big scar. Okay. Really big scar there. Self-conscious of it? A little bit like, you know, or not guys, it was like a little no, different than no, girls. I, yeah. And back, then, badge they, of and honor, back right? there, was, there was no social media, so it was like, kids were probably like, you're probably like, who'd you beat up? <laughs> what happened to you, man? Look at that. And they, they, you know, kids being, kids being kids. So that faded over, that okay. faded over the years, but uh, it, it killed all my teeth. It sheared off some teeth. Uh, when it happened, and so that was pretty painful, and I had to have teeth reconstruction, and it's to the point now that I'm looking at implants. Okay, and it's probably, it's not probably, it's from that event. Okay, I'm a little too young for all. Yeah, of this. No, and I got so you. there's some, there were some long term things, but it did not. Well, at least you don't have to be like George Washington and get the wooden teeth put in now. Dude, I've thought of that. Yeah, well, he was the ultimate military. I know, guy, it, right? I know yeah, it. he's a role model. So and you talk about role models, right? Your dad's a role model. I think you told yeah, me a story, too, about working on a dairy farm, right? And, yep. and when you went to working on a dairy farm, what would you learn out there? So when we, my brothers and I, two older brothers, when we would hit that, like, 12, 13 years old, we would have the opportunity. Well, I, I say opportunity. He kind of threw us there on purpose. <laughs> we would go work on the farm for the summers, and it was a dairy farm. And so you'd learn how to milk cows, you'd have to bale hay, and you had to pull your own weight. There was there was no option to not pull your pull your own weight, and I remember this one 
uh, this one time, I don't remember how old I was, but one of the, the, the farmer were getting ready to bale hay for the day. And so this was a Herculean effort. You'd have people on tractors, you'd have people stacking in the barns, you'd have people driving wagons back and forth, and then you'd have people on the wagon stacking these. And that's where I was. I was on the wagon stacking these. And the farmer, it's, you know, I, I later saw it in the military, but we were doing a pre-action briefing, like a safety <laughs> brief, and the farmer was, okay, everybody, everybody know their job. And we can't be killing well, any kids out there today. No, no, it was a, it was a well-oiled machine. Is of all these people that mostly were volunteers, neighbors and whatnot. And he um, he turned to me and he said, "You know, this is a, this is an important moment in your life because this is organization." And he said, "You have got to plan your work, and then work that plan." And that stuck with me for, you know, forty years or more. That concept of making sure you have a strategy, whether it is your life, whether it is your school, whether it is whatever. Mm -hmm. Your business. Your right? business. A lot of entrepreneurs Your listening, marketing right? plan, your sales plan, how you gonna raise your, your kid? life plan, how to raise your kid. What's the plan? And then are there going to be hiccups? Yeah, of course. Uh, do you have to be flexible? Absolutely. But we have a starting point and we have a roadmap of where to go. So that impacted me big time. So that's it. When you say that now I'm like thinking back to like, not my childhood. Cause like I grew up in the suburbs, but my parents, you know, uh, my mom um, grew up on a dairy farm in Minerva, Ohio. Yep. Uh, my uncle Mark, you know, her mm -hmm. little brother, uh, who's a roofer in Monaga Hill, where, right. where you're based out of now. Um, that's what they grew up on. They grew up on a farm. There's a lot of hard work, you know, a lot of work ethic, you know, um, showing up on time, you know, being organized, right? Like having a plan. And the more I think about it, you know, some of the values that I have today that, you know, as you say that, I'm like, somehow those were passed down. Even though I didn't have to do milking cows or working on a farm, they had it in them, and somehow they were able to pass that through to me. Home. Now, you know, me and you are both working with, you know, in this new age, right, with these young kids and even some old kids, right, that don't have those same experiences, right? Don't have the family mm -hmm. that had, like, the, 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 to work on the dairy farm, right? Because, you know, like you said, you had to do it. Like, there was no choice. You know, it wasn't like, and you couldn't just go like, to your phone and, like, play on YouTube or, like, you know, go hide in a video game. Or not or, show up. Or, or not show up, <laughs> right? You know, your dad probably had some side deal with his farmer where he got free milk or eggs or something, you know what Probably. I mean? Like, who knows? Yeah, or he was probably engineering a bridge to, like, get from one part of the farm to the next. You know, who knows? But, who knows? But, like, what do you say to, like, you know, like, do you feel like you were lucky? I feel like that was, like, when you look back, it's like, wow. That is, like, you could have paid money for that type of, like, education. It, um, so for my brothers and I, we all, all three of us turned out to be hard workers. And none of us, we're very different people, but none of us have ever shied away from the challenge that life brings mm. and just that hard, that hard work when, um, it's really, really hot. It's really, really cold. That's not a reason to not do what you, what you have to do. And so that's perseverance mm -hmm. and stick to and the value of hard work and doing what you have to do, even when you don't want to do it. Yeah, that's so good because, you know, I know being from an being an entrepreneur now, um, you know, there's no giving up, right? Like you, you like that's one of the like the core competencies, right? Like you got to be right. persistent because you're going to get rejected, you're going to get knocked down, people are going to let you down, right? And you can either decide to like kind of give up and like oh, and then a lot of times we'll just chase a shiny object. Oh, you know what? You know this wasn't working. You know oh, I'm going to go try that. And that could be a trap, right? A lot of times. And if you don't have that inner like self to be able to say, hey, I just got to keep going, keep going. I'll iterate a little bit and I might change some things on the fly, but I got to keep getting back in there. And you mentioned military, you know, that you dreamed about actually, that was like your goal, right? And then you mentioned that you actually did go in the military. So when did you actually make that decision? Um, did you have to get recruited? Like, you know, I remember them calling like the house every day trying to recruit me. This was back in the late nineties. So like, it was probably a little bit more like that. Or did they just, just people just sign up at school one day and say, hey, I'm going in. So in school, we had the opportunity to take the ASVAB, which is the armed services vocational aptitude battery. It wasn't required, but it was optional. Is that a, is that an academic test or a physical the test? Entry, no, it's a, it's an academic. It's a written test. Oh, okay. It's, it's a written test. I would have probably failed. And so, uh, I, I remember I took that. And the recruiters just were, they were, they were calling. 
And the re- because I missed one. You only missed one. I missed. I, I missed one. Out of how many questions? I don't remember. A hundred. I don't remember. So you get ninety nine percent. Yeah. So at ninety nine percent, and you know, Navy's calling. Hey, you, we want you in the nuke program. <laughs> we want. We'd like you to do this. Well, we'd your like dad's you an engineer, that. and you want to be in the military. It's a recipe for like it's, something's it's brewing. Something. And you're a hard worker from the dairy farm. From the yeah. dairy farm. So because of my dad and his his background, we were. I don't want to say push. That's strategizing. Not the right we were strategizing. strategizing. He was, he, he, was, was he was working the plan. He was working the plan. He was moving us to be engineers. And my uh, my oldest brother became an engineer. Uh, he went to he went to Pitt, became an engineer. He's still an engineer to this to this day. So I I followed. I followed dad. Yeah, my grandfather's an engineer. He worked on the parkway. My dad's an engineer. He does gas lines. And my brother's an engineer. He's working for PennDOT. I'm like, okay, John's got John's got to do his thing. And so I went to engineering school for a year and I couldn't I couldn't I lost the vision. Mm. I lost the vision. Why do you think that was? Um I uh, Oh, bro, you ask deep questions. Yeah. All right, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. Don't use it against me. I'm not. Um, I was not ready, mature-wise, for college. Tell me why. I'm not sure exactly why. I thought, you know, from the farm, and I was in 4-H. And was I it too boring? Animals and, so not enough uh, work, like physical work? Like... Well, there was no, it was all mental. Well, that's what I, I mean, mean. Where you're not used to it. Like, no. you, you mix the physical with the mental all the time, right? right. So I'm just trying to think. Um, do you think it could have just been like, I'm sitting in a chair all day? And I'm I like, couldn't see myself behind a desk. Yeah. I just couldn't. Especially from being outside your I whole life, growing up in the country, man. You're a free spirit. I couldn't see myself behind a desk. And I lost, I lost the vision mm. of that path. That path became dark. And so. Did you tell your dad? Um, well, I'll tell you the story. Okay, I'll tell you the story how this happened. So um, I called, I called the marine recruiter in Charleroi, and I said, uh, "Hey, you busy or, or you want to talk to me?" This is a cold call, by the way, folks. <laughs> and he says, "He says, come on, come on down. I'll be standing outside. You, you can't miss it." Of course, he's standing there in his Charlies. I didn't know that's what it was called. He's standing there in his. They're modified Charlies, is what they actually are, and. Um, uh, I just I stopped and talked to him and I signed right that I signed right then and there, and I called my dad and I say would you meet me would you meet me for lunch, and so I met him for lunch and I said hey I just I just joined the Marines, I'm not gonna go back to college I just joined the Marines, and um, so this is not you're gonna get a glimpse into this this forward planning thinking he said uh, what what's the plan after that. And I, I, I said to him, we were at Hey Andy's, which doesn't even exist anymore. You remember Hey Andy's? Yeah, right? yeah. You know, yeah, Street. right down there on Main so Street. We were, we were di- well, it was a dive bar now, but like back then, like it was it's probably closed. Like, it's no, been closed. It's closed now. It's gone. Huh? It's gone. But back then, it was probably the happening place. It was a happening place. It was right. full for lunch. Every booth is taken for lunch. And he and I, he's getting his suit. And, you know, I'm just in jeans oh, and a t shirt. Yeah, you, don't, you didn't wear a suit into the Hey Andy's in 2015, I can tell you that. You didn't? No, no, no. no, no. no. It would get so dirty. This is, this is 90. <laughs> This is nine. Uh, no, this is eighty-seven. Okay. This is eighty-six, eighty-seven. It's somewhere around there. Right after the movie came out, Good and Morning so, Vietnam. He's uh, <laughs> he uh, he's wanting to know what's the plan after that. I told him. I said, I, I don't have one. I'm just going to try and survive the next couple of months. Uh, and so the vision changed for me because the plan was, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna become uh, a state trooper. That was my vision. Now, so, how do you go from engineer yeah. to state trooper? I don't have a clue, bro. But the vision was I'm going to be a state trooper. And so I figured I'm going to become an MP in the Marines. So when I come out, when I do my time and I come out, they're going to be like, hey, come on in, man. We, we're, you're set. So I'm, I'm, getting the, uh, I'm getting the physical. And part of the physical is called the flagrant test. Have you ever heard of that? No. So there's 14 cards. And on each card, there's a circle. And within that circle, there's a number. And normal vision people can see all 14 numbers. And so I'm passing the physical flying colors. We get to that, and the guy starts flipping. I'm like, dude, I don't, there's nothing there. He's like, no, there's a number. He said, you have to tell me the number. I'm like, 
42. He said, that's not it. You seriously can't see it. I'm like, dude, I'm telling you, I cannot see. So he flips through. Out of the 14 cards, I could see three numbers. Is it like one of those, like, with a bunch Colorblind. of circles and colors? And then, it's like, the, it's kind of hidden in there? Yep, it's oh, hidden Oh, so I've seen colors. that test. I didn't know what it was called, but I, I, I do know what you're talking about. Where there's a bunch of, like, light, different color circles, yep. and then there's yep. some circles with the number. And if you can see it, you can see it. That means you're not colorblind. If you can't see it, you're colorblind. That's right. What does colorblind have to do with anything So in the military? Um, in the military, for what I was going to do, which was uh, MPs, I, my, I signed a contract to be an MP. I was going to go to boot camp, and then I was going to go to MP training, and then because you did so year. well in the ASVAB, they said, you know what, we're going to put you, we're going to put you somewhere. No, Good. that was no. totally against the ASVAB. Different. Oh, okay. Totally. They, oh, all right. they, they, they wanted me to go in the nuke program pretty gotcha. much because of the ASVAB, and I'm like, I'm not going on a submarine. Two. I'm, I'm six four, man. Yeah. So no, yeah. no, we're not. Oh, yeah. Listen, and I can't not, wear bell not, bottoms. Not to change the subject, but I was in San Diego. Right, I had to right. be on a San, the, in, in one of those. Uh, I can't remember the USS Missouri, maybe. Okay. I can't remember. It wasn't a sub. It was like a carrier. Mm -hmm. But when you go down and below, I was literally hitting my head, and they said, "Well, back then, like you know, five eight was like the the, the big. You know, that was a tall guy." And I was like. Man, I would have never, I would have been miserable. I would have hit my head. I would have been uh, miserable. So six, now four. Now you know where I'm coming from. Six, four, yeah, I can't even imagine. I'm like, dude, I'm not wearing bell bottoms. And I'm not hitting my head 20 times a day. So no Navy. So, uh, but in the, uh, you have to be able to see colors to be an MP. Because you may need to identify witnesses and what they're wearing. Flags going up, you know, different colors, you know. Well, <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> with the MPs, with, with the MPs, you know, you're chasing criminals. Right. Yeah, so yeah, you got to yeah, be uniforms. Able, you got to be able to see colored uniforms, right? It was it was their rules. And so uh, they canceled my contract. There's a pivot coming. I can I can there's feel a, it coming. There's a pivot gotta coming. got to call dad. you got to make a... There's a pivot coming. And so... Um, Did you know you were colorblind at that point? Mm -hmm. So they didn't even have that back then. Like they, like they So your whole life... At this point, like, you were probably, what, 20, 8, 19, 20, 19, 19? 19. 18, 19. You had no idea you didn't, couldn't see colors. Did, like, was that, like, a thing? Had you ever heard about that before? My grandfather was color child. And it never came up to where, like, something was like, I don't know, what colors do you struggle with? It's basically a red-green color line. So, like, grass is what color to you? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, so, I can, I could, you couldn't figure this out as a kid? Like, when somebody would say, is that green? You just knew it was green because they said it was green, right? It looks green to me. Because that's what they tell you it is. So then you programmed in your mind, right? You're subconsciously programmed that even though that you may see it as red, like it's green to you, right? Is that why? Uh, well, I that's know, a whole other podcast, I know probably. The, <laughs> yeah, this isn't about our problem. So I know the stoplights. Red, yellow, green. I can, Cause I can it's, cause, see Because of the sequence. But what I uh, what I see here's what they told me, what I see and what you see are two different things. Like you can like you can point at something and I'll say like this. See this? Yeah. That's red. I know that's red. But what I see and what you see are not the same thing. Yeah, like you know, the it's heart. Your, yeah, it's red. It's a red heart. But what do they say that you see it as? It's I don't see what you see. Is it gray? Is it like? No, no, it's red. Yeah, but that's because you know that it's red. Well, I see red, but I don't see the same red you see. Gotcha. So it's not bright and vibrant, and it's it's totally it's totally different. So anyway, interesting. Sorry, so rabbit the trail. The, <laughs> we're going down a rabbit hole. So the uh, the the military people there said, if you want out, you'll never have a better have a better opportunity because we just canceled your contract because you were signed to be an MP. And you didn't even go through boot camp yet. No, no, no. I hadn't even left. So like, oh, I'm, so like, I'm in downtown Pittsburgh. Yeah. I'm at the military processing station on Grant Street, right? And there's thousands of people doing this with me. Hundreds of people going through these physicals. And so the guy, the guy says, if if you want out, just walk. You're 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 done. This is over, because your contract is to be an MP, and you can't. You're you can't physically do it. Okay. So I'm. I'm at a turning point. I'm at a defining moment. Ooh. This is a defining it's getting good. moment. And so because I am uh, extraordinarily smart, I look at the guy and I say, well, you got anything else? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, oh, son. You really don't want to go back to school. <laughs> we got something for you. And uh, that's when I signed the contractor to become an O331 in the Marine Corps. What is that? That's a uh, machine gunner infantryman. Ah, uh, so just a just a grunt, just, just a 
A machine gun what? Machine gunner. I was a machine gunner in the infantry. Like where you get to like stand on top of a tank and like shoot people? Well, that's no, what I hear. When those you say machine, tankers. Those when are you tankers. say machine gunner, oh, how about just like well, laying in the field with big like Rambo like like bullets everywhere and just yeah. shooting machine guns? Yes. That sounds like a badass, man. Exactly. That's what I thought. Yeah. Uh, but it's, what was uh, it? It's torture. <laughs> it's it's torture because you're not in a tank where the tank is carrying the machine gunner. You're walking. Uh, we Ooh. call it humping. You're humping 25 miles carrying your machine. And what's that thing weigh with all the? <laughs> well, the 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 50 cal receiver's got to be 35, 40 pounds plus oh, your boy. bag, yeah. and it digs into your shoulder. You carrying all the, the ammo barrel. too. Oh, yeah, you got to carry the uh, ammo. What do you think you're going to air drop it? Well, no, I didn't know if they had another grunt that would carry your ammo for you. Well, I have we no would, idea. We had a machine gun team, and you got the, you carried one piece. Like, you'd have to do Gotcha. The, the, so it took a couple pieces guy. to put this all together, right? Because Poor guy thing, had to carry the tripod. He I mean, was 50 just cal ain't no joke. I was in Vegas one time, and, like, you know, you can do these exotic, like, shoots sure, yeah, and stuff. Yeah. You go out in the desert. Yeah. You know, you pay, like, thousands of dollars, and you get to go, like, shoot machine guns mm-hmm. into cars and, like, dynamite and, like, all kinds of stuff. It was it was a blast. That's a blast. I couldn't imagine how to like walk with all that you know they drove us out of golf car you know bougie <laughs> yeah so figure instead of the golf cart with some champagne all right you're in full combat gear helmet flak jacket pack your personal weapon and your machine gun and you're walking 20 clicks then you get to shoot it now you get you're getting, right, the, yeah. you're getting the picture. not for me so that was yeah yeah so that was it's you. not for everybody so it's like so what was boot camp like was it harder than being on the farm or were you ready for it because of the no, farm? No, I wasn't. Foot, did I you was play? Did you play football or any sports like in high school? Mm, I played football for a year. And Basketball, I, I bailed. Like, I so like, not. so the boot camp was like that was a whole experience in and of itself. I'm assuming it it was boot camp is more mental. There's, okay, there's physical, but it's 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 mental. It's mental. yeah, being able to like go to and sleep, get up, uh, do it again. It was a high attrition rate. We lost a lot of guys along the way. When you say lost, <laughs> like we like, never saw them again. Okay, I don't know where they went. They didn't die, right? No, they no, just, they, they no, no, nobody home. died. They went home. Nobody. They went home with their head like rejected from the military, and they had to go tell their mom and dad they didn't make it. Well, either so because we weren't get, at war in that time, right? No, so no, no like, there was no war. So no, that's no, what I mean. No so war. they could just get rid of people. I sure when they're at war, they probably let more more things happen, right? Like it's it's a filtration process. Well, you, uh, I don't know. The Marines are pretty. They're well, pretty the strict. Are they're strict. pretty. They're All pretty right. strict. So we gained guys along the way, and we lost guys. And so you could get recycled. And uh, this is some of that like farm determination from my dad. Perseverance. I was determined. There ain't no way I'm getting recycled from anything. There's no way I'm gonna. I'm not getting recycled. I don't care. I'm gonna go all the way through because I don't want to be here a minute longer than necessary. And so there was out of 65, I think 25 to 30 of us made it originally. So you're not only the smart guy, and then you're also the physical guy and the mental tough guy that can get through all that. So they're, they're filtering you down into like some, <laughs> and a man, right? Like they're, they're making a man out of you. Well, you could, there, was, there were different phases, and they could recycle you if you failed something. So, so what, what, if you failed swimming, you got recycled. If you failed the rifle range, you got recycled. If you failed the PFT, you got recycled. Did you, uh, how many years did you spend in the military? So I was in the reserves for about seven, about seven. So you were through Desert Storm? Yes, I was uh, I was Desert Storm. Any, did you ever have to go to Iraq or Kuwait or anything like that? Mm-hmm. Um, so we had, uh, we had orders for, uh, we were on Camp Lejeune, and we're going to go to Germany, and then we're going to go to Turkey, and then we're going to Iraq as the unit I was in, we were designated as second wave combat replacements. And so you got you to gotta realize the way it happened and the way they thought and prepped for it to happen were, were not even, they were night and day. We were expecting chemical attack. We were expecting extreme resistance. We were extre- they were expecting high casualties. And so the first wave was going to go through and they would get so far and then they would probably they would they would back up. We would go in and replace the dudes that got hurt or killed, and then punch keep, all the way. Keep through. moving. Keep moving. Yeah. But that never happened. So this is this is a good story in of itself. You want to hear this? Yeah. This cool. Okay. So um, <clears throat> this is so military. Anybody, any of your listeners that are prior military, they're going to go. Oh man, I just know I, I'm there. So they send us to the supply warehouse, and 
you figure there's a couple hundred guys in a, in a company and we're going through and we're getting boots, we're getting, uh, we're getting utilities, we're getting covers for the desert. We're getting all these, this desert gear because we're prepping to head to, head to Iraq. They obviously knew when, when the attack was coming, but they didn't publicize it. And we were on, we were on a blackout. You couldn't use the pay phone. There were, uh, cell phones didn't exist. So you couldn't call home. You couldn't talk to anybody. You couldn't send any letters. Total media blackout because they didn't want anyone to know what anyone was doing, which is kind of pretty cool in and of itself. It sucked when you were going through it. But, and so, yeah, your mom was like, is Johnny okay? Is Johnny okay? So uh, uh, we went through and they're like, okay, these are our orders. We're doing this. We're doing that. Two days later, we go back to supply. We turn in all of our desert stuff. We go to the warehouse next to it and we pick up. Uh, camo white cold gear. Where'd you think you were going then? <laughs> like what in the name? There's of, no snow in Iraq. No snow in, <laughs> I, in Iraq. And so um, <laughs> we went to Norway. Oh, I mean, we like, went what, to, do you, what do you do in Norway? What do you do? What do you, yeah, do, what do, you do in Norway? Norway? I, mean, I feel like that's Why? like chillville, right? Why like, are you going you know, to Norway like, in the winter? In the yeah. winter. And so the way I remember it, and my memory might not be perfect, but the way I remember it was that the, uh, the Russians were massing a division in their Northwest Corridor, which is up against the Scandinavian countries. Mm-hmm. But we have a treaty with Norway, or we did, to my understanding, that we protect Norway. We protect the Scandinavian countries, and we have this treaty with Norway, or we did. And what do they give us in return? I guess it, I, I, guess, I, I guess I guess it just keeps them from getting into the UK, and once they get to the UK, then they're a lot closer to America, right? So, and so in order to what, what I think, and I have no proof of this, I have no evidence. It's just yeah, my, I, my play, gut I played Risk before the game Risk, you so get like you know. And so I think the Russians were testing to see if we could handle a two front war. They were testing the wire. Oh, I got you. So Iraq's a diversion. Russia's like, cool, we can spend a weak spot over here. Yeah, we're let's see just going to go see. Let's see if we can get up on the northern side. Maybe we can hit New York City one day. What I don't are know they going to do? That water's tough, though. I don't know how they beat the water. Because that water, you got to they're going to mm-hmm. see you coming. America's got such a cool... We do. That's a cool perimeter, man. <laughs> like, we, there's, no, there's no question. So anyway, we they sent us to Norway. We were an infantry battalion... And we were supported by the Dutch and the British. Mm. And so um, it, it was so serious that they were depth charging the fjords. I don't even know what that means. It what means does depth were, charging mean? It means they were looking for Russian nuke subs in the in Norwegian waters. And the Norwegian waters. Yeah, so there's a barrel of dynamite, 55-gallon drum of dynamite, and it's got a pressure switch. So they launch it in, and when it gets down... 500, 600, 800,000 feet, whatever they set it to, it goes off. Then what happens? It, it, it kills subs. Really? It's a sub killer. In the water? In the water. It yeah. can, like, explode out through the water and actually do damage. Oh, my gosh. The pressure wave caves in submarine bulkheads. That's so fascinating. That's yeah. a whole other podcast. We didn't even start We didn't even start this to talk about this kind of stuff. No, yeah. but, like, you know, you never know. So, all right. So, you're in there. So, like, what happens when you get out of the military? Like, like what, do you, yeah, so, what, do you do, what do you do for work? Uh, so and was your mom and dad proud of you that you made it through like all that? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. They yeah. were. They were like they're okay. We we, we they were okay with you not going to college. You know. Well, when uh, when when we came back, I did the college. Thing. Oh, so you were actually ready to sit down and sit still. I was. Uh, you, had I, enough, I you, had was en- you had enough exploring the world. <laughs> You're like, okay, was, it's time. I to- was changed. I, and so um, I worked a couple of odd jobs trying to figure out. I sold cars for a while. Really? Yeah. Sold cars for a while, which That's was a great, great experience. Great experience. Great. I would never do it again, but it was a great me experience. Me neither. Maybe on a Saturday. Hey, if you need me on a Saturday to close well, like four I or would, five jobs, I would, I would love to just, sell like, like once a year, I would love to come in and just put on a show to show all these young whippersnappers at these dealerships that are how they're half falling asleep, how to actually sell something. How to sell a car. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I would do, I would never do anything but a Saturday. Yeah, if I had to, that was that was my only day. I loved selling Saturdays. Yeah, I sold five cars one time on a Saturday when I was like 19 years old. It was the biggest rush ever. 
It's still to this day one of my favorite days in sales. I mean, I was working two, three deals at a time. And then afternoon, a couple more deals would come in. I was like multitasking, finance, desk, negotiating, demos. Like I was like, it was like, I was like the puppet. That's oh, where the, the journey of my entrepreneurial experience, like really, because customer service at its finest, closing deals, and just the action. And then like feeling like you're the man. Like you're the man. Yeah. And then that commission check came in. You know, you were rich. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a special. I remember when, uh, so military, military behind me, I'm out looking, looking, doing different yeah. things. I'm selling cars. And they had this, they had this promotion. The sales manager said, if you, uh, if you bring me a $500 check as a down payment on a deal, whether the deal closes or not, I'll give you a $50 bill. I'm like, I want to I wanna take the girlfriend out somewhere tonight. You know what I mean? I want to go somewhere nice, not usual. Yeah. Nice. Somewhere better than Eaton Park, right? Instead of Eaton Park, yeah. I want to I go out somewhere and have dinner and some drinks. Uh, and so I walked out. There were two hundred fifty dollars cash at the end. If, you, you had five of them. You got five checks. I got five checks. I only closed two of the deals. If you know you, you being the smart one, you probably had, you had one lady that probably wanted to put twenty five hundred dollars. Can you write me five separate checks and see if I can pull that one? through? <laughs> nah. No, I didn't do that. No, that's all right. I had five different. That's five what different I would have done. Though. I would have been like separate checks from the same customer. Does that count? <laughs> The sales manager was pretty sharp. I yeah, and know. probably pretty mean too. If you were to pull something like that, back yeah, in the yeah, yeah. Well, the one, the sales manager was cool. The, the uh, one guy was part owner. Mm. The GM was oh, part okay. owner. He was total stereotypical he was the used hammer. car guy. Oh yeah, the he hammer. was the hammer, buddy. He was the hammer. Yeah. So after um, I got a job at the utility as a pipe fitter. Did your dad help you out with that? He did. <laughs> Yep, <laughs> gotta I'm not be gonna lie. Utility. Gotta be in that like. I'm not gonna lie about it. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I would do the exact same thing for my son. Yeah. When the time, if the yeah. time. Hey, comes. listen, you can. You know, the big fish is always hiring salespeople, so just you know, you can you pull your weight. That's right. <laughs> so uh, I went. I started out as a union pipe fitter, digging ditches for a gas utility. Back in the dairy farm. <laughs> First thing you do when you stop at the job site is you either get out the shovel or you get out the jackhammer. And that's how that's how our, our days went. This is this is pretty cool. So back in the day, it was local six six six. Oh, that's a terrible number. It's a terrible number, but we had a we had a really cool logo. We had a we had a demon with horns and a hard hat and a jackhammer. <laughs> we had an awesome logo, dude. It was it was bad. That's, they've now merged. It's long since gone. Long, long, long time ago. Um, they joined. I think they, they joined with a different national. It doesn't matter. Uh, so um, while that, while I'm doing that, they had tuition assistance. And so uh, I took advantage of that, bro. And I got two degrees while, while working at the, uh, at the gas company. And they paid for it. Everybody. Did your dad pay for your other brother's college? Mm -hmm. So your dad was probably like, dang, dude, this is awesome. He's probably like, that John, man, he, I knew he was smart. <laughs> I didn't know how smart, but that's pretty smart. <laughs> well, soon after, I was only there like a year and he retired. He retired. They went through a downsizing and he got caught in that. He got caught in that. So he was... And your brothers had probably already gone to college. They were long gone. Like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like those checks are already paid. Like they, like you needed to figure out a way to pay for I had to college. figure that out. That's right. I had moved out long ago. Was on was on my own. We had some we had some tough times on our on our own. The wife and I starting out. Yeah, when did you get married? So we got married in uh, ninety one. Okay, wow, ninety one. About was it a year after Desert Storm we got married? Oh yeah, I mean ninety one, ninety two, ninety one, ninety two. Yeah. I think it was yeah. Something she, like she's that. probably not listening, so she's not going to yeah, give you a hard time. She's now. Just, yeah, I, don't even, I don't even know how. I mean, what is so that? Is that thirty right years? It's 40, 35 we're, we're, years? Thirty. So next yeah. month we'll celebrate thirty one years. Wow. All right. So it was ninety two. There you go. Yeah, we got married in ninety two. It was uh, May sixteenth, nineteen ninety two. We got married. So it was about a year after, it was about a year after Desert Storm we got married. And then you worked in like, what I want to do is like, how did you go from like, like big utility company? Because I remember meeting you, I don't know, it's probably been about 10 years since I moved to Monongahela from Ohio. And uh, I remember you were working at a job somewhere like, I feel like you had a, like a big time job somewhere doing something cool. I don't know. So uh, I'm in the union, right? Okay. And I'm getting, I'm getting my education. And I start applying to get into the salary group. But in the union, you have a stigma. They don't 
unless it's you go from union member to foreman mm. is a natural transition, but anywhere else in the company is not is not really natural. But because of my sales, because I had some sales background, I got hired out of the union into the inside sales group of the gas company. Took a huge pay cut to do it because there was no overtime. It was salary. And I was making good money because I never turned down overtime. But then you had to get out of the union. Had and to get from out everything of the union. I know is like there's a big war between the union and all like the the business executive people, right? Like they don't like, it's like, it's like almost like their own war in their own internal company. And so uh, around contract time, it would build. Yeah. Build uh, Yeah. And then they would sign a contract. Everybody had to be friends for, it had to be friends again. Uh, So I, I, I spent quite a time applying for jobs. I wouldn't get interviewed. Nobody would give me a chance to get out of the union because I was a union guy. Well, a guy gave me a chance and he hired me into the inside sales group. And from the inside sales group, um, I survived two severances, two severance things, and I wound up in the retail end of the company. So it was no longer the actual utility. It was still the same company umbrella, but mm-hmm. it was like a, it was an unregulated department. I'm, you know, I'm sitting here. I can't help it. I just got to blurt it out. How do you go from sales to then want to like go into the union and like and then know like how good of a life you could have in sales? Like and how like how do you justify that? And like how do you like how do you stay in it long enough to yeah, I, I'm still thinking like cuz once I started learning sales, I was like, is there anything else about like there's nothing like that's the best life that there is. Well, um I had a defining moment. What is that? I had a defining moment. So, you're going to relate to this. I okay. Was, I was on the showroom floor. And this lady bought uh, a brand new car and she was a single mother and she was middle aged or or a little better. And, uh, I like level one sold her. I sold her hard and she probably should have been in a used car at a lower payment. Hmm. And so she drove, she She did what John wanted and whatnot. She wrote what she really needed. So she drove oh. away, and I'm waving. I'm waving at her from the dealership parking lot. And then I turned, and this voice hit me. What'd you just do? Mm. What'd you just do? Yeah. So you can't compromise who you are for the money. Well, and that's why I got fired from every car job that I ever had, is because they used to make me do things that I was like, I cannot do that. I can't do So I like, quit. Well, I got fired because like, I kept because I kept fighting because I said, well, I want to do it this way because I kept saying, I want to do it this way. You know, they call that the three C's warranty. See the keys, see the car, see you later. You know what I mean? And I'll never forget. I'll never forget. I have a story, too. Got time for me to share this one? Sure, because now you've triggered me a memory. Back in like 2001, 2002, remember they had these little like uh, Ford Escort ZX2s. They were a little sporty version of the, the Escort. Mm-hmm. And this guy came in, this this guy and his wife came in, and they were very middle class, probably maybe even lower middle class. And they had a, another car that they were trading in, and they had a lot of negative equity. So that's, that, that's where, like, you know, they owed 15000 on their car, but we were only giving them ten, so they had to roll that 5000 in on top of, mm-hmm. you know, this new $15,000 car, $17,000 ZX2. Now they're financing twenty three dollars or $24,000 on this little Escort. I'll never forget... Their payment when they left was like $550 a month. And I think it was stretched out over 72 months. And then the same thing hit me. And I remember we could barely get them financed. But back then, because the, the economy was good, like it was like right, maybe it was like right around 9 11. You know, they're just 0%. They're just trying to get people to just keep moving America, yeah, right? Keep moving America. And they were just writing things. And I never, I was like, they're paying. Because I just sold an Explorer the same day and it was like $550 a month. And I'm like, what's happening here? Like, and I couldn't, yeah. And the same thing happened in mortgages. When I got in the mortgage business in 2005, I was working for GE Money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't know anything. I'm a young kid. They trained me how to do everything with computers and a headset. And I was calling people in California. We're doing stated income. Like, and then we were doing like these appraisals that were drive by appraisals. Again, I know this stuff now because I'm a lot wiser and I understood the business. But back then, I didn't know they were programming me. They were programming me to do these things. But not, and that's why I think throughout my career, like I've always like always questioned things. Mm-hmm. 
And like your manager, they're just an employee at these places. Like they're not even the entrepreneur. Like they, like they're just keep trying to keep their job. So they're like, Oh, you're fighting. All right. See you kid. Like they, they didn't want to like try to like, cause I had questions. Cause that heart, right. You know what I mean? That heart's not up there for a reason. Like, I mean, that's real. And so the, I had those kind of struggles too. <laughs> and like, again, and then they say, then they put salespeople, like most average Americans, if you're watching, you think, Oh, how do these guys sell? Like, so it's because, yeah, you guys know the bad side of sales, but there's a good side of sales. There's no question. There is an upside, good side. So let's talk about that. I know we've talked about it a lot. We only yeah. got about 10 or 15 minutes left. Let's talk about how you made the, the, the pivot from this whole life into what you're doing now. I think it's your passion. I could tell it's your passion. It, it, no Helping doubt. people, whether they're young or old, you know, any walk of life with their communication training, sales training, influence, speaking, pre presenting, you know, through the Dale Carnegie. Institute, all the great work he's done over the last hundred years. Obviously, he's passed away, but he's left a legacy. Tell us why you're doing that. What's the good side of sales? So, just real quick, while I was with the utility, mm -hmm. it took exactly 15 years to go from ditch digger to manager. It took exactly 20 to go from ditch digger to director. And so, I had a corner office. I had the mahogany furniture. Like I'm set for life. This is where I live. I'm not going to I'm not going to make VP level because I don't live in the right city. I'm just going to do what I do and and ride this out. Well, they had different plans. Mm. So they out they they brought in an outsourcer because somebody looked at a spreadsheet and said, I bet we can save money if we get rid of John and everybody that reports to him. So they did. They they totally wiped our company mm. out of existence. Hey, real quick, this is a plug for the Big Fish Contracting Company. If you're one of those people right now that have gotten downsized from big corporate America because there's a R word happening in this economy, come here. We got lots of cool jobs and you can do the same type of thing. We're into technology. We're into sales. We're into operations. We're into marketing. We're all into that. finance. We got all that here. All right, go ahead. So uh, I walked, uh, I became a Dale trainer back in, back in 2000. The wife and I had taken the Dale Carnegie course, which the company paid for my, for me to go through mm. tuition assistance. We took it together as husband and wife back in 94. And I stayed on as a graduate. How'd you assistant. get your wife to go to a Dale Carnegie? Was she into that stuff? No, dude. No. <laughs> no. That's the ultimate close. No. That's the ultimate close. How'd you trick her into doing uh, that? <laughs> so she got into a company at kind of the ground level out of college, global company, unlimited opportunity, Right needed to be a little more assertive. So I said to my dad, you know, he's got this, he's got this leadership job and you tell him, I'm like, hey, what, we, what should I do to help, help my wife? And he said, um, why well, send my people to this, this Dale Carnegie thing? I'm like, well, what is that? He said, don't worry about it. Just here's a name, call this guy, tell him who you are and tell him what you want. So I called this guy and uh, I said, hey, I'm, I'm Henry Glanneman's son. He said, you big Hank's son. <laughs> Big Hank. Big Hank. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm Big Hank's son. And he said, good. Come to this address, this day, this time, and we're going we're gonna to take care of you. I said, you, you don't know what I want. And he said, it doesn't matter. Just just come. Just trust me. It's trust your like a church service. Trust your dad. Just come. Just come. Oh, it's all right. So we go. And it was session one of the Dale Carnegie course, and it was in uh, July in an unair conditioned union hall in West Mifflin. And so after session one, I'm like, oh honey, this is perfect for you. This is right up your alley. We should figure out how, how you do this. Now, when I say she needed to be assertive, it was with everybody in the entire planet, but me. So she said, well, I'll do it, but you have to do it with me. Like, no. Not for me. No. I already know this stuff. I said, uh, I, said I, can, I can bottle and sell self-confidence. You know that. I don't and I can, I can get in front of people, 300 people, and, and talk about anything right now. I don't need any of this. And she said, well, those are my terms. And so being the man of the house, I wear the pants. Leadership. I, leadership. I said, okay. <laughs> and so we took it together. We took it together. And, and look who's still there. It's me. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still there. Because it's uh, made such an impact on your such life. Such an impact. Such an and impact. on your wife's life. And, and on your family's life. The, able, the fact that effective communication is like the secret to life. Uh, I've already put my kids through the Dale course. Well, they, well, doesn't your daughter, your daughter course. works there, right? My wife and daughter work. Yeah. Right now. So I walked out of the utility. They threw me out. They kicked me out. And uh, they severed everybody from me on down. <laughs> and I walked right into Dale Carnegie for uh, takeover sales and marketing. I'd been a trainer from 
2000. This was in 2017 when this when this went down. Mm-hmm. I remember and that. So I was a believer. Yeah, I was I was a believer in Dale's principles. Uh, I had been a trainer. I'd done dozens of classes, helped hundreds of people. Which really, it's Dale. It's not me. Yeah, I'm just a mouthpiece, but yeah. it's Dale's stuff. We're, we're we carry his torch. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's and a great torch. You get addicted. You get addicted to that. It's a good addiction. When you hear someone say, um, you know, this changed my life. I'm now doing things differently. I'm selling differently. I'm leading differently. I'm talking to my kids differently. You get addicted to that, Ben. And you want you want that. And so when they kicked me out, I'm like, I know where I'm going. And so I called the franchisee and I said, hey, I got good news and bad news. I'm like, the bad news is they just severed me. The good news is you get to hire me. He said, come on over. Take over sales and marketing for me. I remember that. And so I, uh, after about two years of that, the question came out, hey, how, how would, you like to, would you like to know about how to uh, purchase a franchise? I'm like, no, I don't. Uh, <laughs> I'm not getting sucked into no, that vortex. No, thank you. No. Uh, but, I, that's, but I said, yes. I said, well, let me hear it. It can't hurt to, can't hurt to hear it. And so uh, I went to New York at the corporate office to be interviewed by the CEO and, and some of the executives there. And we put together a three-year succession plan. And the end of those three years came up January 1st of 2022. And my mentor and coach and friend turned this over to me. But as you said, it was already there for me. You know, when I went to the Marines, they were already there. Mm-hmm. When, I went to the, when I went to the Union, it was already there yeah. functioning. When I went to sales, the car dealership was already there. So for me, it's a different experience, I think, than, than you. You've had to start. Create a whole with, you, you had to start ecosystem. With, uh, with nothing. Yeah. I'm just going to say yeah, it there. You had to start with nothing. I, I had the makings, the structure the framework. of an organization. I yeah. had the framework. And we built on that. We, mm-hmm. we have built on that. Uh, and so my, my passion is, I know it's going to sound like a cliche. I don't care. But we help people take command of their work and change their lives. So I never actually go to work. Uh-uh, me I, I don't I don't go to work. Me neither. I love what I do. And so when I'm when I'm on vacation and I'm responding to someone's request, that's not work. Uh-uh. And people, oh well you take work home. I'm like, well, when I worked for the utility, yes. Yes. I, d- I don't now. But you're helping I people. But even it. back then though, you you're, you're, there's someone on the other end that needs help. That is that's that's true. It's just a little. It's a little different. It's but like you're really helping. Different. I mean, but explain to people like first of all some of the Dale Carnegie principles um, quickly. Like what you teach. You know, it's not just sales. It's leadership. It's effective communication, right? Like I think that if you're anybody, a lay person, like the person when I say lay person, somebody that's not in sales or business, right? Like this is so valuable, especially in today's age of where people can't even talk to people. People don't even know how to resolve even good conflict, let alone bad conflict, right? And there's a difference. It's, uh, what's so crazy is Dale published How to Win Friends and Influence People in uh, 1936. Look at this. It's classic. 1936. Yeah. But it's more relevant today. It's more needed today. He's the real visionary. I'm, uh, that's just, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable to me. So we have some core curriculum areas, presentations, sales, leadership, coaching, and critical life skills. And each of those, each of those core curriculum have a course attached to it that you can take. And there's also various modules. So we're a B2B company. We work with businesses, but we also, we talk to individuals. We don't turn anybody away. And so in a public or private setting, so public is where companies say this person or a couple of people or a team, we're going to go and we're going to go to the Fairfield Inn on Racetrack Road, right? And we're going to have a Dale Carnegie course Uh, or a company like I'm I'm working with, I'm blessed to be working with several now that say, please come in and work just with our teams. And we talk to the stakeholders and where are you at? And where do you want to go? What's the vision? And then how, what's the map to get there? It's all about people. To get from where we are to where we want to be, it's people. Okay, well, what skills do those people need to take this business from 10 million to 30 million? 
What, mm. what skills are we looking for? For some of them, it might be sales. For some of them, it might be leadership. For all of them, it's communication and stress and worry. Guaranteed for everybody. I don't care who you are. Ben, I've had, uh, I've had retirees show up at the Dale Carnegie course. And I'm like, hey, what, what brought you here? Curious. And he said, uh, I've been retired for like six months and I'm going to die. Because I just sit there. I don't do anything. I've lost my purpose. I'm hoping you can help me. Like, let's see. Let's see what we can do. Let's work together and see where you can go. And at the end of the course, this same guy is saying, you know, uh, I'm now volunteering and I found my purpose because I can talk to people. And it's all because of you people that took this course with me. You can't, you, yeah. you can't pay for stuff. No, like that. you can't. You can't pay for stuff. You can't. Like I had a guy, my, I was, Last, last, last Dale story. I'm a new trainer, newly minted trainer. It takes about two years to become a trainer. Wow. And I get my own class, which it's a long road. This isn't a, this isn't go for a weekend to Tampa, pay $2,000 and come out a certified well, stamp. Dale. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, this isn't like all that other bull crap out there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll say it for you. Thank you. It, it takes, it takes a commitment and a passion. Right. A passion. And so I got my own class, and I'm walking in an hour early to get things set up. And there's a guy in a suit. He's got his, he got his top button undone, his tie loosened, and he's in a chair facing the wall. He's up against the far wall, like the front of the classroom's here. He's at the, he's at the back of it with the chair all the way up against the wall facing the wall. Can you? And I'm like, dude, they didn't, they didn't train me what to do for this. This wasn't in the manual. I don't know what. So here, well, I, I just got to use my principles. So I go up to him. I say, hey, uh, you okay? And he says, uh, they told me I had to come. They didn't tell me I had to participate. And it was at that moment I knew, okay, I got this. And I said, oh, they lied on you. Because if you don't at least bring that chair up with the rest of us, tomorrow I'm going to tell your boss you weren't here. He's like, you wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man, I would. And so he, and he fought me. Tooth and nail, fought me tooth and nail all the way through. Everything was everything was wrong. He knew better, everything. So we get to the last session. And to the last session, you get to say, hey, here's what I think I got out of this. And here's my vision for the future starting today. And so he gets up there. I'm like, I don't know what this guy's going to say because he fought me all. And the class knew it. Everybody else knew it. And you could have heard a pin drop on the carpet. Same suit, same button undone, same tie pulled down, same guy. And he says... I've been a jerk my whole life. It cost me my wife. It cost me my kids, and I didn't know it, but it almost cost me my job. Mm. And that's why that's why they sent me. And he said, but I gotta tell you, I don't want to be that guy anymore. I don't want to be that guy. And I don't I'm gonna try all of this that we've done to live my life this way, and it's because of all of you. How do you how, how do you buy something like that? Wow. How do you buy something? How's he doing now? That was in 02. That was in the other state. Yeah, it would be nice to stay. It'd be be cool to get him and like like, get him here and like let's talk about like his story over the last. Because I will tell you, as a person, you know, learning sales training at the car dealership, and again, they didn't teach it the way I know you guys teach it. You know, I've had to kind of pick up some. I've had to, like, take some of that, right. mix, it, mix it with my heart, try to figure out my own system, right? Um, but it's really changed my life, I mean, to be able to have that confidence, right? Yep. And then, you know, and really quickly before we wrap up, you know, I had met you, um, I think, through your wife, through the Chamber of Commerce and some stuff yep. like that back in the day. Then I found out you're in this thing. And then when I knew that you were a Dale Carnegie certified, I mean, my ears perked up because, you know, obviously I knew the man was a legend. And of course, never had any time to ring the books, but obviously understand the concept of how to win friends and influence people. And I've since read it. But when you're doing that journey in 2017, you invited me, and I had just started Big Fish maybe a year or two before that, you invited me to a Cleveland seminar. Right. I remember and that. I, and I forget why. I don't know. You probably, because you, you needed people to attend, right? And I, and I was excited. And what did you think of me then? Um, I want to know from an older, wiser man yep, yep. and somebody in kind of our little sector of sales. What did you think of me then? And what's, like, what's it been like watching the journey from an outside perspective? I'm curious. 
So it was a uh, it was a one day cold calling seminar that we ran in Cleveland, and both of us were coming. We were driving in from Pittsburgh that that morning, and if you remember, it poured down rain. It was like a monsoon on us driving to there. And I remember when I met you, I saw potential. I, I did. You're a likable. You've always been a likable guy. You've always been able to talk to people, uh, and I gravitated toward that. And I thought, number one. Uh, I think this would help him. Mm-hmm. Number two, I think it would help us to have him to have him there to share with the others for him to learn and for others to learn from him. And I I thought he is uh, he's going to go national. Really? That's what I thought. Really? Yeah. That's I, what that's what I thought. And you know what I thought? I saw. I, I thought. I, man, I I'm so, I, like I'm like you know over my head being an entrepreneur. I was, I thought I could sell right. I, could, I always knew I could sell a little bit. Have I had some success with that? But at the time, I was like, and I think I brought a guy with me that was on my team because I was trying to impart some wisdom on him because like, right. you know I never knew how to train people. You know, all right. And so that happens. And then you keep doing the the Dale thing a little bit more and more. But like then, you know, from afar, because me and you don't really like stay that connected. Right. Because like I'm busy trying to build a business. Right. Building your business. Yeah. What did you like? You know, and again, you might have been watching far from social media or maybe, you know, maybe connecting with some people in, in the town. But like what's kind of been like watching over the last five years since that time I joined you in Cleveland? So I I follow you on social media, especially on on Facebook. Okay. And I've I've always watched what you post and watched what you watch what you did. And when I saw you start to talk to some bigger level people that were involved in entrepreneurs, I, I thought to myself, and I still think this, that uh, he's gonna tip. He's 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 gonna tip. And then um it's no secret, the Browns. I know the Browns. Yeah. Sharon was my kid's principal okay. at school, and I've known Ed at church for, oh, my gosh, a dozen, 15 years gotcha. or so. okay. And when I saw Ed's coming on board, I was so excited for him and you, and I thought, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be, this is going to be really cool. And so... Um, Ed's one of the first sales guys I ever hired. He was one of the first employees, and uh, he took a shot, you know. And He took a shot. And, uh, yeah, and he's still here today. He actually owns 1% of the company. He wrote a check last year, and uh, I gave him a chance to invest. And he That's believes amazing. in me. They believe, people believe in Like, when people believe in you, there's no better feeling. There's no better feeling when no someone better, trusts you. Yeah, I mean, first of all, his wife trusted him enough to, like, say, hey, go take a shot with this kid. Like, I had no idea what I was doing. I threw him an iPad and said, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna go sell roofs yeah and like so like what else like yeah because i'm always curious an outsider's perspective because i actually trust your opinion because like you know you've had a great life very disciplined you know you've been through a lot you know there's not a lot of people a lot of lot you know i've got a lot of good mentors now but like you know i'm just always curious that perspective um so where do you where do you think what's 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 it look like in the next 10 years for a guy like so, me? You know? where do where do i see yeah where i don't do know I see? yeah so, uh, I'm just curious, like, because, like, now you've seen, like, okay. the, the so past, you want, the present. You, you want to hear this? I really do. Okay. So what my vision, what I, what I see is that um, this is going to go from two locations to a franchise and that you're going to franchise big heart contracting, big fish contracting. You're going to franchise that out and you're going to sell, you're going to become the franchisor and you're going to sell franchises. In Cleveland, State College, Morgantown, hmm. and you're just gonna keep, you're just gonna keep doing the sheets. You're just gonna keep getting wider, wider, and wider. That's what I mean by tipping. To me, that's the tip. It's not who asks you to speak. It's not who wants you, who wants to follow you. It's how many lives can you impact hmm. through your core purpose, and the core purpose is impacting people through a roofing product that everybody has to have. It, it, and more importantly, the service that the we service, provide. Because everybody's service. got the product. You can go to Home Depot and buy the product. You can right? buy the product. That, and like, ain't nobody want to hump that stuff up and do all that. And then take you know the customer service part, let alone the roofing, right? Like, it's like the customer service, right? They all want that Amazon and Disney World experience, you mm-hmm. know, Chick-fil-A service, right? Like, it's like, how do you deliver all that? And it's a lot more than just sales. It's a lot more than just roofing, right? Because it's all about the people. It's people like Ed Brown, right? People like Ed Brown. It's people like, you know, Kaldi Dalski, who's running the production, you know, on, on our podcast, right? And, uh, 
Yeah, and I actually have been I've, I've actually been in talks, and I wrote my vision out, and I think I might do it a little different than a franchise because, okay. like, I you know I, I get no 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 it's like, who knows though I, there's no no plans, but with franchises I've seen where it can get like tar, like tar, like Daryl Carnegie's got a good tight. Like tight, like I don't want to say control, but again, I don't really like control because, like you know, because I had like part of me like if somebody comes in and they want to be able to be a more of a free spirit, it's like it's hard for me to like tighten down the entrepreneurial dream. So I was also thinking about because I am more of a brand and marketing guy, more of a licensing deal where okay. where maybe I license them the fish with the heart, right? And you know, and, and we and then we just check in with the entrepreneur to make sure they have so many five star reviews, so many like their employee happiness, right? To like, hey, we can pull the license and the and the and the name from them if they don't like you, but they they're free to kind of like Create what they want, right? Whether it's a taco truck, you know, or like, you know, or a roof rock. Because again, at the end of the day, like, you know, I was thinking like, you know, even a real estate, somebody, a real estate brokerage, if you got some people that really care about people, right? That's the, that's the first quality that matters to me, right? Number is you got to care about, first of all, who you're serving, right? And it usually starts with a customer. Mm -hmm. And then once it elevates past that, it's like, all right, now your team, right? Your, your employees, your teammates, and then your leadership team, right? And then after that, it's the industry that you serve. And then when you can make an impact on the industry you serve, I feel like you can make an impact on the world. And that's what I'm kind of doing through the Big Fish Cares podcast and kind of traveling around the events and stuff like that. So I really appreciate you being here. Um, this has been this has been fun. Um, been awesome. I, I know you came to my sales training. I had you come in and do a guest you know, spot for in for an hour or two the other day. I know my people got a uh, good kick out of that because they you know they get tired of hearing from me. You know, <laughs> but uh, well, you're like they don't want to hear from their family. They had to hear from somebody yeah. outside. You know, there's five questions I ask every guest on the show. So yep. imagine you're on an island. There's nobody else on planet Earth. You're by yourself. Tom Hanks Castaway. Think about that. Okay, you're allowed to take one book with you. What book do you take with you? Just one? Just one. Just one. Um, I take the New Testament. Wow. Now, you want to take the whole Bible? You just take the New Testament? I take the New Testament. Because it's got all the good stuff in there, right? That's awesome. I, I love that. that. Yeah, we need to get to talk about faith. That's a whole other podcast. That's a whole we should. Podcast. I love talking about that. All right, you're allowed, to take, you're allowed to take one movie with you. I'm allowed to take one movie. Yeah, what uh, movie? Um... All right, I'm probably going to take. I'm probably going to take Lord of the Rings. Which the first one? Yeah. All right. The first one. That's cool. The the journey. Yeah. The fellowship. Mm, the know, community. I, the community. I, I, <clears throat> I. They probably get sick of me, but I have the best people in the world, and they do amazing things, and they help so many people. And so I kind of, and uh, we're like the fellowship of the principles, Dale's principles. I could see you going to like a Lord of the Rings conference and like dressing up, taking your people there. You guys like nerding out. Like I, I could <laughs> I'd see be that. the only one. My daughter would that's, do it. That's all right. That's cool. My daughter would do it with me. She would. Uh, I'd have to be Gandalf, of course. So you're allowed to have one restaurant, okay? So it could be something famous, something like hole in the wall, whatever. What restaurant are you building on this island that you could eat at every day? So. I know this is going to sound, I don't remember the name of it. That's okay. Tell me, describe it. Where was it? <laughs> so we, um, we decided on, instead of, instead of gifts, we were going to have a destination Christmas as a family. So I didn't buy anybody anything. And I, I mean nothing, but we went to Montreal and we had, uh, we had a Christmas dinner in old town Montreal and we're in this 1700s building it's a restaurant we're on the top floor by the street and it's snowing and the atmosphere was perfect the food was perfect the people were perfect the, the server the greeters the other people in the restaurant i mean it was just and there's one picture of all of us together and you know my daughter's leaving and my son's going to college and so i like i don't want to be all sentimental and goofy but it seemed to me like this is probably the last one for everybody goes yeah. and does their own thing. And that restaurant, I would, it was just. So here's what I want you yeah. to do. Ask your family, because I'm sure they remember the name of it. 
Um, see if you can find that name because then I'll put it in the show notes because I okay. think like cause, uh, I ask every guest these same questions and I always think it's cool because now someone may be in Montreal and they might want to try that place, right? Oh, I now I want to go. <laughs> like I, the way you just described it and by the way, if you want to learn how to tell better stories, come to the Dale Carnegie <laughs> class because that does help you with storytelling yep. which then can help you with influence because you can move people through words. Um, so that's good. So all right, you're allowed to go to one travel destination. You're allowed to leave this island for a week and go anywhere in the world you want to go. Where do you go for a week? So I go to um, I go to Westphalia, Germany, to a small town next to a small little river. That's where uh, we get our last name. Have you ever been there? Mm -mm. Oh wow, that's cool. Mm -mm. That's cool. And there's if you look up our last name, because I've done some genealogy and whatnot. There's not that many of us on the planet, and there's a town that has our last name. It's G L A N E. That's mm. the name of the town, and that's the name of the little stream. Yeah, and then there was Next a man, time. so it had to be a clan of men. That's right. That's, that's right. And I know that's the first how, one that came over. That's how they did it back then. That's day, how they man. did it back yeah. then. You're the, you're the guy or from your John this son, or you're yep. like, you know, someone's son man or something. Yeah, that's cool. Yes. All right, last question. You have 24 hours you're allowed to spend with one person, past, present, famous, not famous. You can pick their brain all day. You get 24 hours. Who's it going to be? It's going to be uh, St. Martin of Tours. I have no idea who that is. Nobody does. Tell Very me. Very few people. Tell me. You're so, an interesting person, John Glenn. So uh, St. Martin of Tours was a Roman gladiator, and he fought for Rome. And he had, um, he had a conversion. He had a conversion. And <clears throat> he had won this this accolades and battle he was a great he's a great warrior i'm sure he did a well lot how did you hear about this him. guy was it in a book or movie like it was in a it was in a book okay it was, it was in a book i mean it's just like 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 from like is this like a russell crowe type of like maximus type of like um, like that type of like gladiator sim- yeah yeah okay. similar but he was a legionnaire he wasn't a gladiator he was okay a, he was a legionnaire okay i say he was a roman gladiator but he, right. was, he was a soldier and he rose up he rose up through the ranks and he won his he won his freedom or he won his whatever retirement, and um, Caesar asked him what he want, and he told Caesar, I, "I want you to release me so I can go serve." And he did, and he's riding out of he's riding out of Rome, and there's a guy on the side of the road, and uh, beggar, freezing, freezing cold. He gets off his horse. And he takes off his cloak and he uses his sword and he cuts it in half and he covers up that beggar with half of his with half of his cloak. And I'm convinced, and I think I probably got this from the story, that beggar was Jesus. Wow. It was it was Jesus. And so uh, he became a saint because of all of the things in service to others that he did after that moment. He was called to help. Wow. And I really identify with that dude, you know, because now I don't, I was never in combat. I never, I never actually saw combat, uh, but I was a Marine and I did what the, you were in I, the union. I, I was in the union. That's combat. <laughs> have you ever seen a, if you've ever seen a jackhammer on Frankstown road, that is combat, bro. Yeah. Um, but I really identify with him. So I'd, I'd like That's to spend awesome. time with him. I can promise you that'll be the, you'll be the only guest. I'll probably do it. You know, this is probably an episodes, you know, late sixties, early seventies when this one comes out. But even if I do a hundred thousand episodes, I think that that'll be the only time. That, like, there's been a lot of other people mentioned, but that is definitely unique. So, John Landerman, thank you so much for being thank here. You, if you guys got value out of this podcast, like, subscribe, comment below. If you have questions for John, I'll make sure that he checks on them. Um, if someone wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to get in touch with you? DaleCarnegie.com. And they can find you, right? And you're on LinkedIn, right? I'm on LinkedIn. John Glanneman. I'm on Facebook. Cool. We have we have Facebook sites for all three of our franchises. Awesome. We have LinkedIn sites for all four of our franchises. Um, but you go to you go to DaleCarnegie.com, it'll find you based on where you're at because it's got the it's got the AI behind it, the locator. Right. Yeah. And you fill out the contact us form and just say, have John call me. That's all. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate it, man. Thanks, brother. This, right. is, this has been great. All right. We'll Thank see you, you guys on another episode. Every Friday we drop Big Fish Cares podcast. Thanks. 
Thank you for listening to the Big Fish Cares podcast.